The next uh, presentation module is on IC camouflaging, another design for trust technique. Um, this time, the threat model is different than logic locking and split manufacturing. This time, the untrusted entity is the end user. Um, IC camouflaging assumes that the foundry is trusted, so we may talk about a scenario where we have a fab, uh, like a very large um, well-established fab such as TSMC that we've been working with for a very long time. So we trust them, but we do not trust the users or the devices that our chips will go into. Uh, these users can potentially reverse engineer the chip and recover the design details, so we do not trust them. And IC camouflaging is a solution that would uh, protect against such trust, untrusted um, end users. So let's uh, revisit reverse engineering. Um, the idea in reverse engineering is um, the chip can be obtained and taken out of a device. It could be depackaged and then the layers uh, on the chip can be peeled off one at a time by using chemicals and uh, images can be taken from individual layers under an uh, electri electron microscope for instance and then these images can be analyzed, stashed, and processed to recover the, uh, the net list uh, that led to this, this chip. Um, reverse engineering can actually help with certain things. Uh, you could do extensive verification. You can uh, take a look at what your chip looks like under a microscope, uh, compare the patterns against your design. Um, you can also use reverse engineering for detecting IP violation. You can take your competitor's chip, you can have it reverse engineered and check whether they've pirated your IP, they used your IP illegally. Um, but of course, reverse engineering can also be misused um, uh, by untrusted, for instance, end users, um, and it could be misused for IP piracy or illegal fabrication. Now, reverse engineering in its good uses, um, it could be it, it is provided as a service by a company called Chipworks in the who who is based in the in the Bay Area, um, and uh, Chipworks offers this service uh, for companies to uh, to detect potential IP violation um, by their competitors. So, why does reverse engineering uh, work? Um, the simple reason is that under a microscope, from the top-level image, the pattern that is observed directly infers the functionality of that component. So a NAND gate, for instance, and a NOR gate, they look different under a microscope. And you can easily say that this is a NAND gate versus this is a NOR gate by just analyzing the pattern under a microscope. Um, so they're very easy to reverse. The, the standard cells are very easy to reverse engineer. But of course, you know, these standard cells have been optimized over decades. Their, their low power, um, delay and area, everything has been optimized for standard cells over the years. But the problem is that they're easy to reverse engineer. Now we can talk about alternative cells that we refer to as camouflage cells or camo cells in short that look alike uh, from the top level view under a microscope and yet they implement different functionalities so in the in the figure on the right we see a camouflage NAND cell, NAND cell and a camouflage NOR cell the patterns are identical and yet one of them is implementing the NAND function the other one is implementing the NOR function. So this is this is very good uh, in terms of resilience against reverse engineering because the pattern no longer implies the functionality. However, as the picture demonstrates, these camo cells are slightly uh, larger in terms of area. They consume more power and they are potentially slower. So there's a price to pay uh, to, to get this resilience against reverse engineering, uh, you pay in terms of area power delay. Um, so how can this, how can this be implemented? Uh, how can we have identical looking patterns yet implementing different functionality? One way that this can be accomplished is through the use of dummy contacts. This is an invention by a company called Cypher Media. Uh, Cypher Media 
provides camouflage library cells to design companies. Um, a, a dummy contact is, is a contact that is void inside. There is no electrical uh, contact within, within this dummy contact, and yet under a microscope, it looks as if there is a contact. So this is a proprietary technology of Cypher Media uh, International, and uh, the, the idea is, again, under a microscope to create some ambiguity for the reverse engineers. So how can we incorporate this into the design flow? We have our original netlist, let's say, and when we go into synthesis, we not only use the standard cells that we know that are easily uh, reverse engineerable, um, we also use camouflage cells, so we use a mix of the two. And uh, we create a layout, and now the layout consists of patterns, uh, corresponding standard cells, as well as the camouflage cells, and we send this layout to our fab, um, and of course, you know, let's remember that camouflaging assumes the fab to be trusted because fab sees all these. The fab sees which cells are standard cells and which cells are camouflage cells. So the fab has all this information, but we're not worried about the fab in the IC camouflaging threat model. Um, and then we get the chip. Now, up until this point, from the designer's point of view, from the defender's point of view, there are decisions to be made regarding how many camouflage cells can we afford to use in our design, uh, in, what in what structures do we use these camouflage cells, in what parts of the design do we use these camouflage cells. So these decisions dictate the security uh, obtained out of using camouflage cells, and of course these decisions uh, have implications in terms of the area power delay overhead that these camouflage cells incur. And then there is the attacker's uh, point of view. The attacker takes this chip, they depackage it, then they delayer it, they do image processing as we discussed, they put it under a microscope, they take individual images of the layers, and then they reconstruct the netlist. But this time, the netlist will have some ambiguities, and the ambiguities uh, stem from these camouflage cells. The attacker under a microscope cannot tell uh, for these camo cells, whether it's a NAND gate, whether it's a NOR gate, because there are these contacts that could potentially be true contacts or dummy contacts. So there's this ambiguity um, imposed on the attacker. The attacker does not know the functionality of the camouflage cells. All the other standard cells, they're easily reverse engineered, so uh, the attacker knows the functionality of other gates, but the camo cells are unknowns for the attacker. So, um, is camouflaging employed currently in the market? Um, is it feasible? The answer is yes. As, as I described earlier, Cypher Media is a company that provides camouflaged cell libraries to design companies. And uh, TSMC, uh, a major chip fabrication company, Chip Foundry, they support camouflaged cell, uh, they support uh, manufacturing with camouflaged cells. Uh, it is widely used in satellite applications and TV setup boxes. There are millions of um, chips uh, out there that use camouflaging. And the question regarding whether it's, it's secure uh, is a research problem that the community has been working on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are decisions to be made uh, from the designer's point of view. Um, how many camouflage cells do you insert into a design? How much security would that get? Uh, which gates do you camouflage? In what structures do you use these camouflage gates, camouflage cells, to get resilience against a variety of attacks? These are all research problems that the community uh, has been working on. So the threat model um, assumes that, obviously, first of all, the, that the end user is untrusted. So what does the untrusted end user or the attacker uh, have? in terms of assets. Uh, the assumption is that the attacker has access to a functional chip that they could use as, a, as an oracle. Uh, Input-output patterns can be produced on this uh, functional chip. Um, the other asset that the attacker is assumed to have is the reverse engineered netlist, <coughs> which is a camouflage netlist. Of course, this netlist has ambiguities 
uh, because of the camouflage cells. And we also assume that the attacker has access to a camouflage cell library. So for every camo cell that is encountered in the camouflage netlist, the attacker knows the possible functionalities of that particular cell. It's, it, it's not that the cell can implement any functionality, but rather it's limited to a number of functionalities. For instance, a cell can be either a NAND or a NOR, a two-input cell, two-input camo cell. Um, and then the attacker's goal is obviously to know which functionality that the camo cell, that each camo cell is implementing. And for this purpose, the attacker performs simulations, computations on the camouflage netlist and produces some input patterns that they apply to a working chip. They get the responses from the chip and from the responses they try to figure out what the functionality of each camo cell must be. Now let's, in this simple example, illustrate the attacker's point of view. Um, we have a netlist uh, that has been reverse engineered and we see the standard cells are easily reverse engineered so we know their functionalities but we also have two camouflaged cells, two camouflaged gates here, C1 and C2 and the attacker doesn't know uh, the functionality of these two cells. The attacker's goal is to figure the functionality, figure out the functionality of C1 and the functionality of C2. So for this reason the attacker needs to do uh, needs to compute some patterns um, that make sure that the, the cell, for instance C1, is exercised with all possible two input patterns because the idea is to reconstruct the truth table of C1 so that the attacker can say what C1 implements in terms of functionality. So not only all possible two input patterns should be brought to the inputs of C1 and there are four of them uh, for two input patterns. The output of C1 should also be sensitized to one of the outputs, uh, the primary outputs, so that we know how C1 responds to each one of these uh, input patterns. Now, only then the truth table of C1 can be reconstructed and then uh, the attacker would know what C1 is. Is it an AND gate? Is it an XOR gate? Etc. And the same needs to be repeated for C2 as well. Uh, to figure out the functionality of C2. Now, if the attacker also has access, as we assumed, to, uh, to the camouflage cell library, then the attacker's life is easier. So, in this example, let's assume that C1 can either be a NAND or a NOR gate uh, in reality. So, it's a camo cell that could be of functionality NAND or functionality NOR. If that's the case, the attacker's life is easier, as I said, because all they need to do is bring one pattern to the inputs of C1 and then sensitize the output of C1 to one of the primary outputs. But it only takes one pattern to understand the functionality of C1 because only one pattern is sufficient to differentiate NAND from NOR. For instance, 0, 1 would give you a 1 for NAND and 0 for NOR. So if you bring in 0, 1 to the inputs of C1, then, and if we sensitize the output of C1 to the output O1 in this case, then we'd know what C1 is. Is it NAND or a NOR? In this presentation module, we talked about another design for trust approach, uh, IC camouflaging. Uh, IC camouflaging assumes that the fabrication facility, the foundry, is trustworthy but the end users are not. So the, the challenge that IC camouflaging is trying to tackle is trying to get resilience against reverse engineering. And uh, IC camouflaging at the expense of area power and delay can deliver that resilience against reverse engineering. Thank you very much for listening.